Hello, friends. How are we doing? On this episode, I interviewed Diane Schiffer. She is she breaks all the rules okay she is someone who she goes by also your chubby vintage nana she's an older woman who has almost two million followers on TikTok and instagram making these really beautiful reels and videos talking about what she's learned in her life and just how to love yourself better so i had her on the podcast I, i've known about her since i started this work which is crazy almost three years ago now i finally reached out and said diane let's get you on the podcast it turns out she loves our work as well so we talked about a lot of things we talked about wisdom we talked about evangelicalism, Christian nationalism, what it was like for her to see people kind of fall in line with the support of Trump. It's a fascinating conversation. So I hope that you enjoy this talk. Friends, again, thank you so much for being here. It means the world. If you want to support the work that we do, you can follow us on all of our social media channels. You can subscribe to this podcast or YouTube channel if you're watching this on YouTube. And we are a nonprofit. Let me just say that the reason we're able to do this work is because of donations from people like you. Many any hands fake light work, any amount helps us so much to bring you better and better content like this as we push for a better way forward in the church and advocate for accountability and hold space for folks marginalized by the evangelical church. Thank you so much for your time for being here. Let me know what you think about this episode. We'll talk soon. See ya. All right, Diane Schiffer. You know, it's so yes. interesting. I discovered you on TikTok two or three years ago. Um, and somehow I think you found me on TikTok. Then I we found each other on Instagram. And mm -hmm. we've been we've been commenting on each other's stuff for a few years back and forth. Yeah. And eventually I said, you know, I, I just need to reach out to her and get her on the podcast. I have so many questions. So it's so good to have you on. Thanks for making time. Well, it's so wonderful to be here because you know what? You are one of my tippy top favorite content creators. Stop, Diane. Don't you do that are. to me. <laughs> you are. And I have to tell you, when you started the New Evangelicals, it was like, I was like, oh my gosh, there's other people like me. You know, that was how I felt. Yeah. And it was wonderful. So. Well, it means a lot. It really does. I, I love doing this work. As you know, it's a total honor and privilege to be in the world of content creation and have people mm -hmm. follow you and 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 tell you that that your content is helping them. So mm -hmm. I don't take that lightly. I appreciate that. I, I it's it's so hard for me to know even where to start with you because you're such a <laughs> fascinating person digitally. Let's talk about your actual content, then we'll get into okay. some of your background. From okay. what I can tell, you you just do this content that makes me feel so happy. It's just super sweet. Aww. And like the way it's shot, your house looks like it's something out of almost a fairy tale. And I'm like, <laughs> who is this person? And her <laughs> attitude is so beautiful. How do I be more Aww. like Diane? How did Aww. you get into content creation, living the life that you live off camera to now doing mm -hmm. stuff that quite literally millions of people see probably daily? Well, I... Well, first of all, I have to say it is such an uh, honor and a privilege, like you said, to be a content creator, right? Yeah. To to be able to do this and put and like I I told somebody recently, it's my art. You know, it really is what I feel is my art. Yeah. I how I started was I was on Instagram for years, like since it began practically, right? And just the typical little, you know, boomerish old lady kind of account, right? And back at the beginning of the pandemic, it was 2020. Okay. Mm. So the pant, we were just starting, you know, in June of 2020, like four years ago now. I finally hit like I think a thousand followers, one one thousand followers on Instagram. And so I made a like a really self-deprecating post at making fun of myself and just saying, whoa, I hit the I hit four digits, you know, blah, blah, blah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks to all the little people that follow me. <laughs> that kind of thing like that. Well a friend of mine whose husband is a big YouTuber. She messaged me and said, you know, I think you really could do content creation. I think you'd be really good at it. And so she said, she challenged me to go to TikTok and just start making videos. Just put anything up 
you know, whatever. And so that's what I did. And the first day I did a picture of lemonade on my front porch, right? You know, gripping content as <laughs> one would expect. I apologize for noises out here. You're so fine. It, was com- it was completely silent. Now somebody's doing lawn work. But anyways, and then that evening I was like, oh my gosh, I have to put something out up tomorrow morning, right? <laughs> and so I was like, what am I going to do? And I was flipping through what I had on my phone and I had a thing of me doing my hair that I had accidentally shot in time-lapse, right? Because somebody wanted to know how I did my hair. So I thought a video accidentally shot it in time-lapse. And so it had been sitting there in my photos. So I thought, okay, well, I'll just put this up, right? So I put it up and I, I did the voiceover Mm. sitting in the front seat of my son's truck And you can hear, if you listen to that, you can hear the truck radio in the background. And at the very end, you can hear the screen door slam when he's coming out to the car. (laughs) But anyways, long story, a little bit shorter, that, you know, sometimes things hit. And that hit got millions of views. And yeah. So that gave me like 50,000 followers, like right at the beginning. Yeah. So it's interesting talking to a fellow content creator on the record publicly, mm-hmm. knowing thousands of people are listening to this because it's a very unique kind of world. And it's true. Mm-hmm. One video um can gain you tens of thousands of followers, and then a hundred mm-hmm. videos can gain you nothing. <laughs> right. Right. But the thing is, and what I tell people though is even when your stuff isn't hitting keep putting stuff out Yeah, because that was one thing. Like when I had the second video that hit a lot of people were like, well, you don't have any, you don't have any content. Right. 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 So, yeah. 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 So, so at this point, your content seems to be kind of helping maybe folks like myself or younger Gen Z millennials think about things from a very wise perspective from someone who's learned a lot in their time on this earth. Is that kind of your approach? Because some of your videos, I'm like, oh, this is so helpful for me. And it's just, it comes across very kind and empathetic, but there's also life lessons in there so often. Is that intentional for you? Yes, I would say it's intentional. And I think a lot of the time I am saying what I wish somebody had said to me when I was younger, you know, when I was going through those struggles and, you know, now I'm on the other side of it. It's so easy when you're at this, this part of life and you're looking back, it's easy to see the perspective and how everything falls into place. Yeah. And so just being able to kind of do that. Well, tell me, tell me about your life. Did you grow up in like evangelical Christian circles? Do you, do you, or did you have a partner? Like, what does that look like for you? Mm -hmm. What's some of the backstory there? I grew up as an Episcopalian. Mm. My family was very involved in the church, but we were Episcopalian, which is, you know, of course, not evangelical, right? Wait, wait, hold on, hold on, time out. I have to ask you. So you're telling me you did not grow up with a deep-seated fear of being raptured up to heaven while the world burned behind? No, I did not. Wow. I know. That must be nice. (laughs) It it was very nice. It was very nice. (laughs) And I have to tell you that even when I was deeply in the throes of the evangelical subculture, I never really invested in any of that, right? Mm. I, I think that I was inoculated with sensibility by the by the Episcopal church. Right. (laughs) So, yeah. And I, I mean, and I raised my kids in that evangelical subculture, but I was always telling them, "Eh, I don't think that's right. How did you move? How did you shift from Episcopalian to the more evangelical subculture? When I was in college, I was radicalized when I was in college. (laughs) You were born again. (laughs) Yes. And well, actually, you know, when I was born again was Back when I was maybe 11 or 12 years old, when I was in like middle school Mm. and our school was really small. And so middle school, high school was all together. And Mm. that was back like when the Jesus freaks and the hippies and all that. And so there was a group of them in my school and they were like super cool. Right. And they started having a Bible study during lunch. And I went to that and that's how I 
huh. you know, became born again, right? Wow. So, so that was, so my faith was always, like I always said to, I can remember telling my Baptist pastor who was horrified by this, but I said, I feel like I always was folk, I always was close to God. Mm. You know what I mean? I mm. always was super close to God. And it was just, you know, steps, right, that helped me to realize more of him or something. I felt like I always was not born again, but I didn't need all that to bring me to him. I don't know if that's clear or not, but. Yeah, well, yeah. it's interesting. I've observed this phenomena interviewing so many different types of people, folks who grew up deeply embedded in this evangelical culture since they were a child have a very right. different path to re to recalibrate their brain compared to someone who grew up in a different part of either Christianity or the, or a religious tradition. And then later on, kind of assimilated into or converted or converted into evangelicalism, their path out was, it seems generally speaking, much easier because it was easy to say, well, no, of course, I don't, I don't believe that people are going to be left behind and, ra and and we're going to be raptured up to heaven. Or of course, I don't believe that, you know, uh, most people are going to burn in hell forever. But when you're told that at age four or five, and there's movie right. culture around you, right. the brain just forms differently. And it's a much harder Absolutely. thing to unpack. So it makes sense that you growing up Episcopalian, and mm -hmm. having this foundation of faith, but one that wasn't so fundamentalist, it would be right. easier for you to say, no, don't believe that. No, that's definitely garbage. Oh, this could be good, but no, this part yeah. definitely isn't. Does that make sense? But still, it's hard though, yeah. because like, and I still struggle with this hmm. sometimes. It's like, we've been fed because I've been in, I mean, I was raised in the Episcopal church, but when I went to college from that point on, from the point when I was choosing right? My, my faith community. I was at like, you know, a assembly of God church, right? That's where I went when I was in college. And so you have all that. Yeah. And, and I struggle sometimes now with, okay, what's, um, what's actually true. Mm. What is the Bible actually telling us mm. about God? If this, if, if scripture has been used to manipulate and has been misinterpreted, so flagrantly where do i find the line of truth like you know like at one point i was like does god even really love me you know mm -hmm. and because you can't believe i i can't believe anything any of those things that are in evangelical doctrine they're just meaningless to me now right what a, what attracted you to the evangelical subculture was it that they seemed more cutting edge they were more down to earth and then what were some of the moments where you started realizing this discrepancy between the theology like you mentioned and mm -hmm. the subculture that you and your family were a part of um i think what always drew me was god mm. always always jesus it was always that because like i said before i felt like even when i was really small i was drawn to God, right? And so that was it. And and just craving to have and, and security too, like craving to have that security of knowing hmm. that you're you have God and you've got this relationship with him. And then too, it was to be honest, like in college, it was a really nice little social group, right? Yeah. So yeah. it was great. I mean, we had a lot of fun together and they were great friends. And, and, and the pastor of the church that I went to when I was in college was an amazing, wonderful man. You know, mm -hmm. I don't ever want to get back in touch with him again, because I'm afraid he's a Trumper. <laughs> and I, it would just break my heart. <laughs> yes. But, these are very yeah. similar themes for a lot of people, including myself. I, I had a real sense of belonging, a sense of community, mm -hmm. et cetera. So this was when you were in college. How long were you in that Assemblies of God evangelical world? Was it for, you know, from college up until five years ago, 10 years ago, 30 years ago? No, I was, I'm trying to think. Okay. I went, I was in the Episcopal Church or the Assembly of God Church. And then I came out and I went, at, when I got married, I went to a, like a non-denominational full gospel church mm -hmm. for many years. And then my husband and I 
moved to this area, upstate New York, and we went to a, it wasn't a full gospel church. It was, I, I don't even remember what, the, Wesleyan, I think it was okay. the Wesleyan church. And, and then after that, we went and we found that very dry. It was mm. very, was not, you know, so, and then we went back to an assembly of God church. So it kind of like flittered around, <laughs> you know? Yes. Yes. So yeah. Okay. And, and then I went yeah. and then, then I went to a Baptist church after that, mm. like a Baptist, like a, like a, like a fundamentalist Baptist church. You've been around. Least, I have, I've been around. I've, I've seen <laughs> some sites, Tim. No, but I went to the, the reason why we switched to the, the, well, when my husband left the assembly of God church was just, it was horrible. It was horrible. So yeah. So we were basically like abandoned. Mm. And, and so then we went to the Baptist church. And the reason why we went there was because at that point I had children and I was homeschooling them. And that particular Baptist church had a really vibrant homeschool group. Right. I have no doubt. I have no yeah. doubt they did. <laughs> As someone who was homeschooled, we also found our homeschool mm -hmm. group through a more fundamentalist type of like yeah. non-denominational Baptist space for sure. Yeah. So yeah. that yeah. makes a lot yeah. of sense. So yeah. did you have a moment then when you quote unquote deconstructed or started rethinking things? What was that like for you and for your family? Well, I will say that as my kids got older, Right. And I don't know if you, re well, you know, the whole purity culture and the, the stay at home daughters, that whole oh, thing. Yeah. Do you remember oh, yeah. that? Yes, I do. That whole debacle and the, you know, I kissed dating goodbye. I mean, I was looking at that and I was like, this is just wacky. Right. Mm -hmm. I just, this is just wacky. And so that was, that was kind of a step back for me but we were still in the midst of it. Right. But right. just mentally it was a step back. And I, when I would talk to my girls, particularly, you know, one of my daughters was really into it and she'd say to the younger kids, you don't kiss until you get married. And all of a sudden I'd be like, you totally can kiss before you get married. You know, that is just <laughs> crazy business. Uh, yeah. yeah. I remember but, watching a movie out there called Pamela's prayer. And it okay. is one of these like focus on the family type of movies that they produce or feature films for family mm -hmm. and uh, families. And the premise is exactly that. It's it's a, it's based on apparently a true story where mm -hmm. this girl, Pamela, and her future husband don't kiss until their wedding day. They call everyone by their full name. So it's Pamela, it's Frederick, it's father in the movie. And the movie is unironically a great example of how weird purity culture can be because one of the recurring themes in the movie is that Pamela, ever since she was a young girl, her dad would, would pray with her before she went to bed because their mother, her mother passed away early on. Mm -hmm. So as the movie is showing you at Pamela at age five, at age 10, right? You see this recurring mm -hmm. theme that her father prays with her. Well, on her wedding day, she gets married, the camera cuts, it doesn't even show the kiss. Then the next scene is her in a nightgown sitting on the side of the bed, which is presumably her wedding night bed. And before anything happens, she calls her father so her father can pray with her before the they go to bed. And, you know, you think you're just like, that's kind of weird, guys. Like, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. that That's a little bizarre. So I think the even the filmmakers didn't realize how weird it was to have someone's mm -hmm. father call them on their wedding night. To right. pray with them before they went to bed. It was just one of those things right. where you're like, this, this, it's not adding up. It's just not. They're so steeped in it that I'm sure to them that was heartwarming and yeah. blah, blah, blah. Right. right. You right. Know? And it's kind of like, I didn't yeah. see that coming. I thought you were going to be, say, that she was sitting there with her husband and they were praying together and that was the shift. But oh, no, what? no, 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 no. Her, her and her and his daughter and her father. So anyway, but yeah, I mean, I, I, most people listening to this, people who probably follow both of our accounts have had some mm -hmm. experience with books like I Kiss Dating Goodbye yeah. and the stay at home daughters movement for mm -hmm. sure. And that's part of the reason, honestly, I think why accounts like mine have become so influential in these spaces because mm -hmm. a lot of people got messed up by this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and for me as a person, you know, with a failed marriage, you know, my husband left me mm -hmm. and I'm still not divorced because 
as you can imagine in that whole thing you don't divorce you stay married and yeah yeah i mean that that's a whole that's a whole nother layer of that whole thing right mm. so yeah and yeah, and i, well, I remember i can remember one time i can't remember which which fundamentalist site or group it was or whatever but they wanted to like interview me and showcase me as somebody who had been you know like left but still did not get divorced right oh. and yeah and I was like no I and I felt like saying you know I I'm not going to give you what you think you're going to I'm I'm not going to give you what you want oh. so let's just yeah. how did that make you feel how did it make you feel so weird and icky yeah, it made me feel extremely icky and also because like you know, I've made choices about my own life and my own, you know, like I chose personally, I decided I would choose celibacy. Okay. Mm. But that is not a choice that is an easy choice. Right. And it's not something that, you know, I felt like what they wanted me to do was like pressure other women who are in right. that situation to make that choice. And that's not, I would never do that in a million years. So yeah. That's pretty classic evangelical approach, though. They 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 tend to take mm -hmm. people who might operate as like maybe an outlier, right? Who maybe it's 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 not the most mm -hmm. common scenario where someone is right. separated but chooses to be celibate, and then they'll mm -hmm. prop that up as like this is the norm for everyone, right? Yeah. This is yeah. just how it should be for all women out there and all people. If out you're there. godly, right, Tim? If yes. you're godly, yes, yes, then that's what you'll do. Which right? I am. I'm so godly, <laughs> Diane. I'm, I'm the most godly, <laughs> arguably speaking. You know. <laughs> Well, um, godly womanhood, we all strive oh, for. Oh boy, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I just did a couple of weeks ago a conversation with, with with Matthew Vines. He's the founder of the Reformation Project. Mm -hmm. He's a gay man married to his partner who fights for inclusivity in the church. Mm -hmm. And we did a whole response to someone named Rosaria Butterfield, who she claims that she used to be a lesbian, then she got saved. Now she's not. Now she's fighting for essentially telling gay people that in order to be Christian. Her words, that they have to, quote, go back into the closet. It's terrible stuff. It's terrible stuff. Wow. But I, we've noticed, I've noticed this pattern that people like that then get platformed by other evangelical leaders and content creators. And they say, look, mm -hmm. if this person could pray a prayer and their gay just flew away, mm -hmm. that's the standard for all queer people. It's like, right. first right. off, not only right. is that bad science, but that's mm -hmm. not the case for 99% mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it frustrates me when folks like you or other folks are tokenized as, mm -hmm. as what should mm -hmm. not be the standard for everyone else. When right. we know right. human sexuality and those decisions are personal and they're also very mm -hmm. complicated a million mm -hmm. factors go a million factors go into it etc mm -hmm. so it's it just it's very annoying to witness yeah oh extremely extremely and because they don't care about the people all they're trying to do is it's like ah here's something i can use to reinforce my personal whatever i wouldn't even say world view because <laughs> it's you know Triggered. <laughs> yeah you know the it's so that i can manipulate people and negate their needs and negate yeah. their lived experience yeah because if they can you know if somebody else if they can take me and say well look at this woman she's you know done this and so if she did it you can do it and you know paint the layer of godliness over the top of it right yes a hundred percent let's mm -hmm. get into 2016 i'm really curious for you the rise of trump happens mm -hmm. at this point where you pretty much out of the evangelical spaces no, or, or were you I there? Was, I was there. I was mm. very much there. Mm. And we were always like, I'm a lifelong Democrat. So I was like the extreme outlier, right? Yeah, In you're the, not kidding. that whole space. I did not even, we did not even talk about politics or anything like that to anybody in that whole world. And as a matter of fact, my daughter did tell one of her friends, right, that we were Democrats and blah, 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 blah. And the next day, the mother of that girl called me and said, asked if we could meet for coffee. Uh, <laughs> red alert, and, red flag. Yeah, yeah. And so we met for coffee and she told me how deeply upsetting that was to her daughter and that asked that I could please tell my children not to discuss the, any of that with any of her kids ever again. Wow. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I wish I can say I'm flabbergasted these days, but you just hear so much. It's like, I totally believe that actually happened yeah, 100%. Right, right. So, and I mean, it was kind of like they couldn't tell, they couldn't say that we weren't Christians because we were, we were the, the girls were doing the nursery. I was teaching Sunday school and right. Wednesday night church and, you know, everything. And so it was just like, they couldn't say, well, obviously you're not, you're in error. You're not a believer. Right. But right, you're all in. Yeah. 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 So, but when Trump started to gain popularity and everything i it, just, it never occurred to me that these people would i i assumed that they would be horrified right mm -hmm. that was my assumption mm -hmm. and i remember sitting in wednesday night bible study and somebody brought up trump right and there was a couple that were like uh, they're like the lions of the faith, right? Oh, elderly couple. I just admired them so much, right? And they both knew the Bible backwards and forwards or whatever. And I can remember he sort of, he was sitting, they were sitting right down the row from me, right? And he kind of like chuckles. <laughs> well, we're not electing a pastor in chief. <laughs> wow. And yeah. And I just, I, I mean, I, was horrified. Wow. I, I had, it was like the whole world shifted underneath me. Right. Yeah. yeah. And everything suddenly became, it wasn't, it's never been like, I don't, I doubted God or anything like that. But when these people that you've looked at as examples of how to be godly, yeah. right. Yeah. And when they are showing themselves as you know as such such flawed people right yeah then it makes you doubt all of that stuff so yeah i tell people often that many of us did not have a crisis of faith we had a crisis of theology right like, yes what what do yes. we believe about this God? yes <laughs> yes the people who taught us i i thought we shared I thought for so long mm -hmm. that because we, well, I shouldn't say thought, I assumed for so long mm -hmm. that because we shared the same beliefs, we would share the same values. And yes. Trump in particular was a moment where I went, oh, we share vastly different values. Mm -hmm. Unbelievably so. Because yeah. you're right. Yeah. When I first heard that line too, we need a a commander in chief, not a pastor in chief. I mean, listen, I'm 35. So when the whole thing with with, with Bill Clinton went down in what 96 or something like that, I don't know. Right, I, right. I wasn't super old. I just heard whispers. But I mm -hmm. remember listening to talk yes. radio that that my dad had on the radio, you know, had on mm -hmm. while we were driving in his work truck. I remember the attacks that Bill Clinton wasn't fit to leave. That he was, you know, how can it I think it was Franklin Graham said at the time, how can mm -hmm. we trust a man to lead the nation if he can't lead his marriage, right, etc. And all so I to hear that and then to see the 180 and pretend like like that never happened. Right. Oh no, we never said right. that. And this is yeah. how it's always been. It was like, what? No. I I I, yeah. I don't understand. And honestly, mm -hmm. even though I understand more these days because I because I track Christian nationalism and I, I read up mm -hmm. on it a lot, I still don't understand. Right. Like I know how mm -hmm. the logic works. It's mm -hmm. still not very logical to me as a Jesus person. <laughs> and yeah. it's it's disorienting to watch people that I'm sure both of us have, have we we knew, we loved, go down this path of like, why are you justifying such blatant hate and deception? And I mean, as of this recording, Trump is on trial for potentially mm -hmm. paying hush money to an adult film entertainer or star that he slept with while he was still married, that he lied mm -hmm. about, and that he used campaign finances to silence the story to interfere with, with the election, right? I mean, like, yeah. this is yeah. this is not yeah. small-time stuff. This is this no. is not, oh, Trump said a curse word one day, end of the world. Mm -hmm. This is this is big time. And when you Hollywood. compare it to to what Clinton did, okay, yeah, Clinton that was a that was kind of that was smarmy and slimy, right? Okay, Definitely. that Clinton did that, right? But it's like exponentially magnified in Trump, right? I I just I I don't I I don't know. I remember right before the election, I and my pastor 
who I still love the man. I still mm. love him. Yeah, yeah. And I still love all those people. I'm broken hearted, but I still do love them, right? Right, right. But I went to him after Wednesday night Bible study once again. You know, that's where all the haps hap, right? On the Wednesday night Bible study. But totally. I went up to him at the end of it and I said, please tell me you are not going to vote for Trump. Right. Please, please. And he said, well, you know, the Supreme Court, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Like, and I said, I don't remember what I said, but he ended up not voting for Trump. Mm. So he came to me afterwards and said, I want you to know I did not vote for Trump. Wow. Wow. Yeah. What 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 are your feelings on watching the Trump fever take over evangelical spaces? Right. I think about in 2016, I heard mm -hmm. a lot of I'm holding my nose, lesser of two evils. Right. right. And now so often, uh, especially mm -hmm. from some of these leaders who have major platforms, it's mm -hmm. it's not that it is. This man is draining the swamp. This man is saving mm -hmm. our nation. This man is mm -hmm. a new Cyrus figure. I mean, it is mm -hmm. it is a full on all out propaganda push mm -hmm. to paint Trump mm -hmm. as God's chosen. How do you feel watching this happen, arguably stronger than ever? I have no, I, I just, I truly have no words to express it. Like that gentleman, the, the couple that I was talking about that was so, you know, I admired so much, his wife is just in a full out adoration of Trump. Yeah. Like she's posted, like, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's like a, like a painting of Trump with two toddlers under each arm, like a toddler under each arm, running away, valiantly running away from a giant spider that has a Hillary hat on it. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm looking for that. That's the, that yeah. is the kind of thing that she posts. Oh my gosh. Have you? Did you find it? <laughs> I found him holding children that are crying. I, I will keep looking and see if we can. No, it's like a painting. Yeah, it's painting, like a, right? Yeah, like a. It's yeah. It's I'll like one of that. those things. There's one where he. I mean, there's a picture of him, like a photograph of him holding crying children, but this is like. Okay, I'll he's keep like for running it. through like a like a I don't know what like a hellscape of some kind, you know. Oh, I have yeah. no doubt. I mean, I've seen. I mean, I, as I'm googling this on Google Images, there's a picture of yep. a painting of Trump draping the American flag as he's holding up li literally the world on, on his shoulders, right? So you're you're. I mean, it is. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, that it is genre wild. of stuff, as you can imagine. It, yeah. It's just wild because I I I I would never expect, nor have I ever seen. Democrats doing that about like any candidate, let alone Biden. Well, we like, don't, like, I know, don't want Biden to do that. That would be weird. No, that would be. And you know something I have, this has gotten me a lot of hate online, but I have extremely deep affection for Biden, right? Mm -hmm. I love the man because, okay, when I was young, when he was, and he was young, he, that was when he was first elected. And that's mm. when he, his wife and little girl were killed in a car accident. And when he was taking the train home every night to be visit his little boys in the hospital, right? Yeah. So that was, uh, he was very heroic to me. And yeah. I think he, I think that that was, I mean, he was so young. Yeah. And yet he took all of that on and continued to be there for his broken little boys, right? Right. So, I my and my kids have joked they got me a mug that says Biden is Bay and it's got a picture of uh, young Biden on it, right? <laughs> so I uh, so it's 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 separate from politics, right? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I it's separate from politics, but even then, even even with that a deep affection that I have for the man, sure, it's nothing. It I would never have i'd never attribute to him these like biblical hero things right yes never yeah he's deeply flawed right he's a deeply, deeply flawed yes. human as we all are and sure. yeah so and even me with my level of affection for him i would not i'd be horrified right oh my but, gosh if some if some christian leader was like let me tell you guys joe biden is a new cyrus figure I'd be like, what are you doing? Stop. Stop. Yeah, yeah. Like, stop right now. Yeah, Do not. Yeah. Like, I would just be so, I, I would be shocked. And I, I think, who is this bro? 
And what is he talking <laughs> about, right? But for some reason in the uh -huh. Trump world, especially with the, the new episodic reformation and the more charismatic mm -hmm. side, man, the stuff they get away with and that is consumed by their audiences is, it, I mean, I, I, you know me, Diane, I'm not here to yeah. dehumanize people, uh -huh. but it comes uh -huh. across like borderline lunacy where you're it like, is, it, it yeah. feels like a real culty, are, are you feeling okay kind of, kind of vibe? Think but isn't that kind of the thing? It, this is just, this is a new thought to me. Okay. So mm. whatever. But like, when you think of the, the, you know, charismatic church, the spiritual church, the assembly of God, whatever, all that kind yeah. of church. Yeah. Isn't there that desire and that don't they use that whole emotional manipulation where you just override sense, common sense that's a that's something that they use and so yes. that's sort of yeah okay here's a thought that i've been thinking about there mm -hmm. is in my and i have no data for this there's no study i'm going to cite here it's purely speculation mm -hmm. but i do think that when you grow up in a very mystical and enchanted view of the bible and how god works mm -hmm. right snakes right. talk red sea is parted god can do all mm -hmm. things kind of vibe mm -hmm. there's a connection to suspending other logical faculties when it comes to things like this, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. oh, the election was definitely stolen. I don't need the data. I just know that it was, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and then, then you you think, well, listen, I, I think Adam lived to be 900 years old, literally. I don't have the data. I just think that it was, right? Like, like you, you can easily see how that kind of world can map onto this and create really problematic understandings that affect a lot of people. And and what are all those things, like believing that Adam lived to be 900? When you say that, then you're de you're demonstrating your your faith, right? Right, right. So, so suspending belief... And believing in the nonsensical is an admirable thing. If you're able to do that, then it shows that you have this great faith, right? Exactly. And I, I think yeah. that that Trump knew, especially with the charismatic side, that, that that there was a real opportunity to exploit people who are kind of primed to disbelieve what's right in front of them and to believe mm -hmm. fantastical ideas about reality and about God. And when you combine yeah. that with this fervor and fever for Trump, who still to this day thinks that or says that that that, that he won the 2020 election, despite mm -hmm. there being, I mean, literally a Mount Everest size pile of data saying otherwise, charismatic yes. people can be more likely who already who who are who are already a predispositioned to support Trump to then think about, well, God could do all things. I don't, I don't need the facts yeah. because, you know, mm -hmm. God already chose Trump and and whoever stands against God is going to be defeated. It right, kind of all plays right. in that way. And don't you think too that the way that 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 he won the 2016 election fed into all that because all of the polls and everything yes. said he was not going to win and then he won and so it's like God has installed him, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. What what do you think about what, terms like Christian nationalism for you? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you feel like do you have a grasp on that? Do you feel like, uh, yeah, I've been, I've been seeing this. Do you feel like it's been overblown? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Because obviously I'm, I'm deeply embedded in tracking that stuff. So I'm, I'm a little biased, but I'm just kind of curious for someone, maybe a little more on the outside, what mm -hmm. you think about, about terms like that? I don't think it's overblown. I think it's terrifying. And I think it is, I mean, I don't, I don't explore it too much because to be honest, I find it the most depressing thing in the world and can so confirm. can confirm <laughs> yeah and so i try to just you know i try to be a happy person and live a happy life as much as i can not that i don't not that i ignore current events because i absolutely do not right but but i 100 percent, and i think it's been brewing for decades yeah right yeah and yeah. i think there's so many people and like even back when I was in in the subculture, right, that they were it was like the American flag and the Bible together, right? And yep. guns. Yep. Yeah. Like yep. I, I've even had people tell me that I'm not a good mother because I don't have guns in the house, right? What? 
Yeah, because people I tell you I, that online. Uh, yeah, somebody told me that in real life. That yeah, uh... because yeah, yeah, because yeah, because if I was, I'm not willing to protect my children or whatever. Wow. Like, I, I should have a gun to, but yeah. I think, and I think oh. it's 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 scary because religious fervor is the most motivating thing i mean you get people to do yeah horrific horrific things in the name of faith yeah yeah and Hmm. uh, are are you someone would you still identify as a christian today are you still somewhere in that tradition are you kind of all the way out at this point no i'm i'm still definitely a christian i definitely but i don't but you know what here's the thing is I very rarely will refer to myself as a Christian. Mm. I mean, because I don't, because I feel like that word has been bastardized. Yeah. 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 So, and I don't, you know, like I, uh, I mean, I just want to live my life. I want to help other people live their lives in a more functional way. Yeah. And you know, God helps me. Right. And I think, but here's the thing. Okay. You know how it is in that subculture that you're, you're supposed to be witnessing all the time, right? Uh You're supposed to be uh constantly bringing people, you know, into the fold. Right. Yes, Yes. I think I've had such a revelation about that and what it actually witnessing is what is it Mm -hmm. it's just talking about what god's done for you or what your faith has done for you and there's no when you're witnessing about anything right you're not asking anything from anybody else all you're doing is talking about yourself right yeah so Mm. yeah and i i think it finally i will tell you that for me It came down to, you know, I went through a period where I was like, is, does God love me? Is God real? Is this all just a fantasy, right? Is this all just a, some kind of a weird, you know, biochemical reaction in the brain, right? Right. Totally. And, and I finally came down to that. I don't know. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know, but I do know that I need God. Right. And if that is a biochemical reaction in my brain, so be it. But God, the concept of God, a loving God helps me be a better person. It helps me cope. And so I'm choosing. I, I, you said it better than I I could. And I, I, that's exactly where I am. I, 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 oh, totally. I, I, Yay. I've gotten hug. to a point. Yeah. Hug. Yay. <laughs> I've gotten to a point where I've said, mm-hmm. listen, I, I'm all done trying to play the atheist versus religious game of like, which one's mm-hmm. true. Right. I, we're, we're, people are going to debate this forever. They have been debating mm-hmm. it forever. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm I, done trying to use my faith as a way to give me some sense of certainty. Like, oh, yes. I know for a fact <laughs> what happens after we die. Those uh-huh. outside of Jesus are going to burn forever and be tortured while I get to go to heaven. That, that's ridiculous. Why is that comforting to people? Why is that comforting? Why do people right? say- <laughs> and and you're right. I've had a lot of those thoughts of like, is this mm-hmm. just my 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 brain firing? You know, and how my how my structure how, how my psyche works, and it's just all neurons and connections mm-hmm. and nerve endings. Mm-hmm. Or is there like this this being out there, this intelligent right. being that like created all this? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I yeah. we I could die and there could just be nothing. I could just mm-hmm. cease to exist. I mm-hmm. I think that is a, a very possible reality. Mm-hmm. And also, I mean, if if I was to enter, and I, I don't want to scare anyone here on the podcast because I know a lot of people are still navigating faith. So please don't mm-hmm. don't take this as like a new gospel mm-hmm. for you. But even like basic questions about the resurrection, like how do mm-hmm. cremated people get resurrected? Right. Right. How is that supposed to happen? How how do we exist in a different universe or or dimension as embodied mm-hmm. people? How does that mm-hmm. happen? How do we get trained? Like, like, even if you just think about it on that level, there's so many. There's a lot of questions. Yes. So I yes. I totally recognize why many people mm-hmm. go. 
you know what? I don't really believe it. I think most likely when our brain turns off, we turn off and we just don't exist. Mm -hmm. Almost like how mm -hmm. we didn't exist for most of human existence until right. how many years mm -hmm. ago, right? Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. that is a viable re reality. However, belief that death does not have the final say, belief mm -hmm. that there is an intelligent creator out there that is relational to their creation, that 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 mm -hmm. that gives their creation dignity and, and is made in the Imago Dei, so to speak, the concept of God taking on human form via the incarnation, taking on mm -hmm. human flesh through the most lowly means of poverty mm -hmm. and living under an empire, right? And being mm -hmm. crucified a criminal's death for no reason. And that's how this God chooses to manifest themselves. Th that, and maybe one day, all of the mm -hmm. crooked in the world, all the injustices in the world are made straight and everything is mm -hmm. reconciled back to their creator. And we live in this place of harmony. Man, that's a powerful belief for me that I mm -hmm. hope is real. And yeah. I want to do my best as much as possible now to make that a reality mm -hmm. here and now. So mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm right. I don't know mm -hmm. if, if this is how it works. I'm not even mm -hmm. sure if Jesus rose again from the dead. I don't know. Right. But right. the belief that he did gives me mm -hmm. hope that there is something beyond death having mm -hmm. the final say for all of us. Mm -hmm. And that's just how I see it now. And I'm, I'm that's, so comfortable uh, there, yeah. you know? Yep. Yep. I am too, because I just felt, I feel like, you know, there's no striving in that. Right. There's no, right. like when you have a doubt, there's no, like a fear, like, Oh my God, I'm doubting. Ah, the world's going right. to come to an end. You right. know, it is no striving. It just yes. like, I'm choosing to believe. Right. It so. feels more honest too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels like I, I don't have I don't have absolutely. to suspend what's right in front of me. I don't have to suspend realistic questions, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have, I don't have to mm -hmm. suspend my my concerns about how the Bible was formed and why things don't always add up. Like I don't I don't have to ignore those things or rationalize them. Mm -hmm. I can admit, yeah, I get it. The Bible is complicated, mm -hmm. and some parts of it are really ugly. Okay, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. some parts of it are really beautiful. So how do we navigate mm -hmm. that? It just gives me more permission, I think, to mm -hmm. acknowledge what is. And that mm -hmm. there's a lot of mystery that we don't have absolute certainty about, and that's okay. And you know what? That's when this crazy weirdness happens, when people are trying to make sense out of the unsensible, right? Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot in the Bible that makes, there's just no way it can make sense. <laughs> right. There's no way. Right, right. 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 At least to um, our minds. Right. I mean, obviously, yes, these authors had yes. an intention, but to, yeah, yeah. to a Western modern mind, it's like, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. what? This is a dashing this... baby's heads against the rocks. Okay. Right. Right. You know, exactly. There's no planet on which that makes sense. Right. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Well, yeah. listen, I mean, Diane, I, I love your work. It, it seems like <laughs> it seems like a lot of what you're doing now is kind of being in a weird way, Jesus to people by showing them empathy mm -hmm. and kindness and being gracious to themselves and thinking about the world in more beautiful ways. Is that kind of how you see mm -hmm. what you're doing in, in, in your own Diane way? I never thought of that, it that way, but I think maybe it is. Maybe <laughs> you've given me a new way of describing it. Yeah. Look at I that. Think, I think because I think God wants us to be kind and gentle with ourselves and we're yeah. so cruel to ourselves, right? Yes. So yes, we are. Yeah. You have are did you hit a million followers on Instagram? You're nope. really close. I'm cl getting close on both. I'm getting close on both, but oh my oh my gosh. I, I good, I'm so happy for you. We, we need more Diane's about, in the world. I, oh, I don't really care about numbers, but I want to hit a million. I just want that milestone. Listen, so. when when we hit a hundred K on Instagram, I was mm -hmm. at like 98. I was like, I just want to hit the number. I, it's just, it's yeah. just, a, it, yeah. it, it, and yeah. you're right. It's not about like, mm -hmm. I, I didn't go to bed that night thinking, oh, I'm a big deal now. No, I went to bed okay. thinking like, it's just, it feels, I feel proud of the work that we've done to get us to this yes. point as a team, yes. as a creator, et cetera. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm with you and I'm rooting for it. Hopefully by the time this episode comes out, you're well <laughs> over the million mark. That'd be amazing. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? We'll <laughs> see. I've been, I haven't been producing as much content lately. So that slowed my growth. Well, it but. could be a grind. People don't understand mm -hmm. what goes on off camera, trying to think about yeah. the idea, shooting it, editing it, you know, and mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway. And I'm slow, you know, I'm a boomer. So it, everything <laughs> takes me 50 times longer. <laughs> Do you shoot everything yourself or is there a team with you? 
No, everything. There's no team. I am the team. I do everything. I do all the videoing. I do all the editing. I do all the writing. I do all the voiceovers. I choose all the music. I do everything. Yeah. I have serious respect for that. That is not easy oh, for anyone. You. Not easy for anyone, let alone someone who really, I mean, you know, for you, I'm sure a mm -hmm. lot of this technology, like, like I grew up very close to the internet. I, I, rem I right. re remember dial up internet. I always had computers in my childhood, but for you, you <laughs> didn't at one point, right? And no, they just kind of no. showed up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now we're talking through the computer, you know, live know, in real time. It's, it's got to be unbelievable. Yeah, that's really okay. great. I, I love your work and I hope that we stay in touch and think about ways right. to maybe collaborate in person. It, it, it would, it'd I be would so, love that. It would be fun. I shouldn't say this mm -hmm. on the air because there's no guarantee, but sometimes I dream about the ultimate, like, you know, podcast round table in person with, with like oh, four or five guests awesome. and, and like with like a live audience. It'd be so much fun. Oh, wouldn't that be awesome? Yes, yes. That would be so fun. I'm full There's of good so ideas. There's so many wonderful minds out there. I'll just be in the audience and watch. No, and I don't know. I think, we, I think we need you there. You bring <laughs> a sense, and I mean this in such a positive way, because I mm -hmm. am a type A living in New Jersey. I mm -hmm. can just go, go, go. And you bring a sense mm -hmm. of tranquility where you're like, Aww. can we just smell the roses? Literally. <laughs> I'm like, you know, Diane, you're right. I'll put my phone down. I will, I will slow my rate of speech. I will be present. <laughs> and we need that. I think people underestimate the wisdom of people who have gone before us, right? You can teach knowledge. You can learn new things. Wisdom mm -hmm. is not taught. Wisdom is experience. Wisdom is learning things the hard way and wisdom takes a lot of time to really form. And I think yeah. it would be a travesty, especially if people like myself who are deconstructing mm -hmm. and trying to find better ways forward, ignored the wisdom of people a few years ahead of us who mm -hmm. have that wisdom. I, I don't, we don't want, we don't want to fall into that trap again, you know? Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. That's, but I have to say too, that a lot of people my age are not the easiest people to absorb from. Right. So yeah, maybe it goes both ways. I I, I certainly can come across uh, pretty spicy on on the internet sometimes. So I'm sure I'm not everyone's <laughs> cup of tea either. <laughs> Diana, well, you're my yeah. cup of tea. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and hopefully soon we do get to have tea in real life. I will. I'm going to try and make it happen great. for real. It'd be great. That Where can wonderful. folks find you if they want to follow your work on TikTok or Instagram? What's the on name? Tic both of them, I'm Schiffer Diane, S-H-I-F-F-E-R-D-I-A-N-E. If you search Schiffer Diane, then th I'll come up. On TikTok, I also am your chubby vintage Nana. Love so, it. Love yeah. it. Diane, what a pleasure this was. Let's keep in touch and we'll do it again. Awesome. I look forward to it already.